The recording is on, so I'm saying welcome everyone to SQL Friday. This is SQL Friday number 13. Our star for today is Guy Glanter, and he's going to talk about the most important performance factor in SQL Server. Uh, that's going to be interesting. Uh, Guy is uh, one of the founders of the podcast SQL Server Radio. Uh, he started it together with Matan Youngman, and uh, lately Eitan Blumen has taken over as co-host together with Guy. And I'm really grateful for SQL Server Radio. I've been following you guys since basically since it started. So oh, thanks. It's, it's my pleasure to to have you on SQL Friday. Uh, I'm not going to do much more of an introduction. I'll have, let the, you do the rest, and you just take over the screen share whenever you feel ready. All right. One question, though. Do you want me? I'm going to relay questions from the chat if there are any. So, do you want them uh, at specific times, or should I just uh, interrupt you? Yeah, just interrupt me whenever. Okay, perfect. Uh, I really prefer uh, people to ask uh, questions and to make it more interactive. I think it's much better yeah. that way. Okay, can you see my screen? I see your screen. The most important Excellent. performance factor. <laughs> exactly. So, hello everyone. I'm really honored to be here in SQL Friday. I think it's a great initiative, um, and I really hope it's going to go uh, for a long time. Uh, so, um, again, my name is Guy. I am from Israel. I'm going to talk about what you see here: the most important factor, uh, performance factor in SQL Server, um, which you probably know by now. It's statistics, and I'm going to explain and show you exactly why I think this is the most important one. Uh, before that. Just a few words about me. So uh, again, I'm from Israel. I'm the uh, leader of the uh, community data platform community in Israel. Uh, we call it the data platform meetup. Uh, we have lots of uh, meetups and uh, a really big community in Israel around the Microsoft data platform. Um, uh, like Magnus says, uh, oh, we also uh, do the SQL Server Radio podcast. You can see here the link. Uh, I blog quite a lot. I speak in a lot of uh, events, conferences. I really love what I do. I'm really lucky. <laughs> um, and I'm also the CEO and founder of Madeira Data Solutions. Uh, we are a company uh, based in Israel. We provide solution services around the Microsoft Data Platform to customers around the world um, and a data platform MVP as well. So that's about me. And this is the agenda. Um, and by the way, this is the. the You're not the... sharing screens anymore. Oh, really? Yeah. How is that? What happened? Sorry. I don't know. It That's weird. looks like it's coming back. Yeah, now I see it again. Okay. Awesome. Sorry. So uh, this is the agenda for today. This is the, the last slide I'm going to show you. It's all demo, it's all hands on. Uh, we're going to talk about statistics, to get to know statistics, what is it, why is it important, how it is used, uh, what we should do about it. Uh, I'm going to talk specifically about the cardinality estimator, which is the component inside SQL Server, which is, which is responsible based on statistics to estimate uh, how many uh, rows are going to get back from different uh, operators in the execution plan, which is super important. We're going to talk about that. And we're going to talk about uh, specific types of statistics for all kinds of use cases, like multi-column statistics, uh, filter statistics, and also incremental statistics for uh, partition tables. So this is the agenda for today. And I'm going straight to the demo. Uh, everything I'm showing you here, all the demo, I have, I have lots of scripts. Uh, I'm going to uh, publish a, a blog post later with all the materials and the link to the recording, and I'll send it all to, all to Magnus, so you will all have access to that. Um, and again, if you have any questions during the session, please feel free to ask uh, in the chat. So let's let's start. So I'm using here a database called Stats Demo. Uh, I always use uh, include actual execution plan and set statistics I own so I can look at what's going on in terms of performance. And when we look at databases in general, we have several properties. I, you can see them here. So we have uh, how to create stats. How to create stats incremental, how to update stats, and how to update stats uh, async, asynchronous. Okay, so if I do this, you can see all the databases. Uh, everything except one, this is why it would import us for Microsoft. All the databases, as you can see, are the same. This is the default. Okay, so by default, for all databases, you have how to create statistics on, how to update statistics on. The other two, which I will talk about later, are off. Okay, of course, you can see that. 
in the user interface as well. If we go to a particular database, like stats demo, to properties, we go to options, then you have here how to create statistics true, how to add the statistics true, and then we have incremental statistic false and asynchronously false. Okay, so those are the four properties that are relevant in our case. Um, what it means, let's talk about these two. What it means is that by default, SQL Server will create statistics for you, okay, while uh, the workload is running. And it will also uh, automatically update statistics for you, okay, which is really important. When I say that this is the most important factor, if you really want poor performance, what you can do is turn them off, turn uh, auto create and auto update off, and I can assure you you're going to get really poor performance, okay? Um, and I will show you why it's really, really important. So, Statistics in general, let's talk about what it means. Uh, SQL Server, uh, again, creates and also updates uh, statistics for each and every column in the database, each and every column in each and every table. Now, not exactly each and every column. Uh, when you start a new database, there's nothing yet, but uh, uh, in the first time that you are going to query a specific column and statistics is required, SQL Server will create it on the fly. So after some time, you'll have uh, statistics for most of the columns, I guess, in your database. And for each column, the statistics means SQL Server calculates a histogram, uh, which tells uh, the Cardinati estimator what is the distribution of values in that specific column. Or in other words, what is the density? Okay, so you, you might have a column like a status, status ID, which has only eight unique values for a one billion uh, row table. This means you only have eight unique values. Each unique value has lots of rows. While another case might be a primary key, transaction ID, which every row has a different value, okay? So you get different uh, distribution, different densities, okay? Now, this is really important for the optimizer to know the, the distribution in order to uh, estimate how many rows, based on your query, are going to be returned. And based on that, take decisions like which index to use, which join algorithm to use, in what order, and so on, and so on. Okay. Uh, if we want to look at the metadata, what stats do we have? Statistic, we have sys stats. We can look for a specific table, like sales orders in my case. And as you can see, in this case, I have already uh, two statistics for this table based on the indexes that I uh, created previously. Uh, there's nothing yet. Okay, I haven't uh, done any uh, workload uh, against this database. I just created it and populated some, some data. Um, and instead of looking at this one, I prepared a query for you. Okay, which joins multiple tables and does that, that some aggregations. Um, you, again, you're going to have this script later, and this is easier to see the, the relevant, the important information about statistics. Uh, you can look at the documentation of the scripts. Okay, so if for each script, there is an explanation what I'm doing here, and I also included some information about specific versions. Okay, so for example, the string ag aggregate function is only available starting with SQL Server 2017, so that you know. You cannot run this script, for example, in SQL Server 2016. Okay, so you need to do something else, like using for XML or, or there are other techniques. I'm not showing here all the possibilities, of course, but just that you know. So, okay, so let me run this, and we will see the same two statistics objects, but it will be uh, more interesting. So we have the stat ID, we have the name of each statistics object. Each statistics is an object with an ID and a name. Um, these statistics in this case are called index statistics. Okay, so we need to distinguish between column statistics and index statistics. Let's talk about column statistics first, which we don't see here at this moment. Column statistics are those that I mentioned earlier, which are created and updated automatically by uh, SQL Server. Okay, when SQL Server automatically creates statistics, it's called a column statistics. It's a statistics for a specific column. Okay. Index statistics uh, is, is a similar object. It's still statistics histogram as well, but it is created while you are creating an index. So every time you create a new index, SQL Server says, I'm going to have to scan the entire table anyway in order to create the index. Why not creating a statistics object, a histogram as well, based on this full scan, which means it's going to be quite accurate. Okay, so you also, you also get an index statistics. Okay, for each and every index that you have. In this case, we can see we have two index statistics. I can tell you that first because of the name, okay, because I know that those are, the, this is the naming convention I have for my indexes. This is the primary key, and this is another non clustered index in this case. But also, they weren't auto created in this case because they were created as part of an index that I created, so it's not considered auto created. It's also not considered user created. I can manually create statistics with the command create statistics, but this is not what happened here. So it's not user created, it's not auto created. 
it's an index statistics. Okay, this is the, the third option. We can call it this way. Another very important column here is when it, it was last updated. In many cases, when we troubleshoot performance problems, the problem is that statistics is not up to date. The last time it was updated was two weeks ago. Distribution changed, something changed, and, and the optimizer does not estimate correctly the number of rows because of that. It can be very helpful to see when was the last time the statistics was updated. Okay, so as you can see here, it was 10 minutes before the session. This is Israel time, okay? So my time right now is, is uh, 1 p.m. and 12 minutes. Um, we can see the number of rows that the statistics was based on. OK, usually it will be the same as uh, unfiltered rows, which is the number of rows in the table. But we can also create filter statistics. I will show you that later. And then we will have a difference between the unfiltered rows, which is the entire uh, the number of rows in the entire table and the number of rows here, which is after you apply the filter. This is the number of rows the statistics is based on. OK, we have rows sample. This is very important. SQL Server, when it creates automatically statistics, it uses a sample rate in most cases, depending on the number of rows in the table, and it calculates this rate. It's, it's dynamic. It's not a, a, a constant number, and it only uses a sample rate, and based on that, creates statistics for the entire uh, table. So you can see here we have uh, uh, almost 10%, while the other one is 100%. This is a full scan. Okay, so we can see different rates, and I will talk about that also uh, uh, later on. Um, I will talk about that later. I don't want to confuse you right, right now. We talked about that. Number of steps. I will show you later how the histogram looks like. The histogram is limited to a maximum of, of 200 uh, uh, steps or, or buckets or rows, depending how you want to call it. Uh, it's called steps in a terminology of SQL Server. So we can see here the number of steps. So you can see that in some cases, if the distribution is, is uniform, it's quite easy to derive uh, uh, What's going on there, SQL Server can really use only two steps sometimes, or three or 15, even though it can use 200. For a very large table, it can it says, I, I can only use, let's say, five steps. It's good enough. I can estimate. Try me. OK, ask me anything. I'll let you know how many rows are there. OK, the modification counter is how many rows were updated or inserted or deleted in that specific column. So insert, delete is the entire row, of course, but how many rows also updated uh, this specific column. Uh, every time you change something in this column, this modification counter increases by one. And at some point, there is a threshold which tells SQL Server, OK, it's about time we need to update these statistics automatically. There were too many changes. OK, in previous version prior to SQL Server 2016, it was around 20 percent and it was constant. Starting with 2016, uh, uh, this is changed. Now it's a dynamic percentage and it's go it goes down as the table uh, gets larger and larger. OK, so we need a, a smaller percentage when the table is larger, which means the frequency of updates will increase. OK, uh, if you are on a version before uh, SQL Server 2016, you can enable trace flag 2371, which does the same thing. OK, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it creates a behavior similar as in SQL Server 2016. As th this is the recommended behavior by, by Microsoft itself. Otherwise, they wouldn't make it in 2016 as the default. Uh, so I think you should enable it. Of course, test, test, test. OK, depending on what your workload. But I recommend you to try uh, Traceback 2371 if you are uh, in a version prior to 2016. And the last thing here is the column name. OK, in this case, we see a single column for each one. We can also have multi column statistics. I will show you later. In this case, it's only single column statistics. OK, so we have all the information we need uh, to understand what's going on with the statistics. Let's move on. First, let me show you what happens, how uh, uh, statistics are auto created. So I will just run a query here. As you can see, we don't have statistics on the order status ID column right now, only on the ID and customer ID. And as soon as I run this query, SQL Server needs to estimate how many rows will come out of this predicate. OK, but since there is no histogram for this column, it is blind. It has no idea. OK, so what it's going to do is going to create statistics on the fly. I'm going to wait, but it's going to be very quick because it uses a sample rate again. And if we run this, we get the results. If we look at the execution plan, we can see here the estimated number of rows per execution. Okay, we get this number, 126,000, while the actual number is this. Okay, so it's really pretty close, very good. Now, the optimizer could estimate it because it has now statistics, even though just a second before it didn't have because it created them on the fly during this pre-execution. If we run the same, long query again, 
So now we have a third statistics. Okay, so when SQL Server automatically creates statistics, we have those uh, names. There is a naming convention, WA, which st stands for Washington because you know it's in Redmond, uh, and then SIS, and then we have some um, increasing uh, uh, number, sequence number, and some other number. Um, I think there's a meaning for that, but I forgot what exactly the meaning of, of uh, those numbers here. But it doesn't really important. It's not really important. Now you can see that it's auto created. It was last updated now. Okay. Number of rows, again, sample rate in this case was 10%, around 10% more or less. Um, and it's on the order status ID. It has number of steps is eight, okay, in this case. So we, now we have a new statistics object. We can also manually create statistics with this command, okay. On the, I, I give it a name. On this table, this is the column. Again, later I will show you multi column statistics. I can specify a specific sampling rate or say I want to do it with a full scan, okay, which is something that SQL Server doesn't do automatically. So sometimes I want to create my own statistics and say I want to do it with a full scan to make it more accurate. I can also use this, which is available as you can see here in specific uh, builds, okay, starting with specific builds. What this means, if I don't include this, okay, and I just say full scan, it's going to be created with a full scan. But the next time SQL Server decides it needs to update these statistics automatically, it's going to use its own, again, same sampling rate algorithm, and it's going to ruin my accurate statistics, okay, with something that is less accurate because it's not using a full scan anymore. So what I can do, I can say, okay, create it with a full scan, but also persist sample percent, okay? So whenever you're going to update the statistics, you're going to persist, you're going to use the same sample percent that I used here in this case, full scan, okay? So if we do this, we have a new statistics on the comments. And if we look at the statistics on the table again, oh, sorry, still running. Okay, so we have a fourth one. This is the name I created. Now it's user created. You can see it's full scan. It's 100%. Okay. And persistent sample percent is 100%. Okay. So it says it here. Every time this statistics is going to be updated automatically, it's going to use the same percent that I used here. Okay. And of course, it's on the comments. This time, 51 steps. You get the idea. Um, last thing in, in how to create statistics. In this case, I'm creating a new non clustered index of the date and time column. And this will also, as I explained before, it's going to create an index statistics behind the scenes with the name of the index. So here it is the name of the index. It's again, it's not auto created, it's not user created, just like the first two. Um, based on a full scan, every time you create an index, it's always going to be a full scan. That's the idea of index statistics. 27 steps date and time. And of course, all the modification counters by, uh, until now are zero. We haven't run any uh, DML statements yet. Okay, of course, we'll do that. If you want to look how a statistics object looks like, you can run the command DBC show statistics with a table name and a statistics name, or you can also use the column name. It will give you the column statistics for that uh, column if it exists. And here is how a statistics object looks like. Okay, so we have uh, three row sets here three parts. The first is a header. We get more or less the same information that I showed you with my query before okay, or this index. The second one is called all density. This gives you the density of the column. In this case, we have two rows. I will explain in a second, but the first one is on the date and time. This is the statistics on date and time. So we get the density on date and time. What this number means that the best way to describe it is if you multiply this number by the number of rows of the statistics, you get the average number of rows per unique value in this table. Okay, so this is the, the average density in the table. And I will show you when and how the optimizer uses this value. Uh, the reason we also have this is because every non clustered index on every table also includes the clustered index key. In our case, it's the ID. So uh, SQL Server treats it as a, actually as a, a composite index with two columns date and time and then ID, which is the clustered index key. So it also creates a multi-column statistics behind the scenes, multi-column index statistics in this case. And when you have a multi-column statistics, like in this case, you only get the histogram, which I will show you in a second, for the first column. Okay, so this is the histogram for date and time only. But the all density information here, you get it for the date and time and also for the combination of both. Okay, um, which is also, this also might be useful. In this case, as you can see, if you multiply this, by the number of rows, you get one, which makes sense because ID is the primary key. Okay, so the average number of rows per unique value, if it's the primary key, of course, it's just one. Makes sense. Okay, and of course, the last result set is the histogram itself. 
which is quite interesting. Let's look at what we can see here. So here we have, in this case, if we scroll down, we have 27 steps in the histogram. Okay, you can also see this number here. And in each step, let's take just as an example this row. Okay, we have the range high key. Okay, so we have a specific value of date and time in the table. This value exists somewhere in the table in some one row or more. And then we have range rows. This gives us the number of rows, the total number of rows between two consecutive uh, values, between this one and the one before. Okay, so between these two values, we have this number of rows in the table, excluding these two values. Okay, we also have how many rows are exactly using the same value here. So we have five rows in the table with this exact value. Okay, this is the range. We also have distinct range. Okay, so between these values, these two values, we have 5,000 total number of rows, but we have 4,400 uh, distinct rows, unique values. And if we divide this value by this one, we get the average number of rows per unique value in this specific range. Okay, so this is what we have from the histogram. So we have these values for each and every range. We also have the all density here. This is quite a lot of information. It might not look much, but the optimizer can really do magic sometimes. Okay, sometimes I wonder how did it do it? Okay, how can it tell so close how many rows based on only 27 steps? Okay, and I will show you some examples later. So this is how the histogram looks like. Sometimes we just want to get the histogram without the extra two results that you can add to the DBC show statistics with histogram and then you get only this okay the same as before but only the histogram we can also use starting with 2016 sp1 cu2 we can use this function there's a new function uh, sysdm db stats histogram so this way you can get it not with dbcc but with a dmv which is more convenient you can then join to other things or do whatever you want with it okay you get the same information okay including a step number and the exact same information uh, you can use it however you want okay um let's look again on a different table this time operation session events again this is my query with uh, all the statistics so again this is uh, uh, at this point we have three index statistics they're all empty nothing uh, empty i mean the modification counter is zero nothing happened to them yet and again let's create i'm going to use this table for now on so let's create an, an uh, auto create statistics on member ID because currently we don't have anything on member ID. So again, I'm going to do this and I want to show you how the optimizer estimates the number of rows. So if we look at the execution plan, so based on this predicate, member ID equals one, two, three, four, the optimizer estimated 20.2992 number of rows for this specific value, where the actual value is, where is it? 28, okay? so. Some people might say pretty close. Some people might say in percentage, this is quite a, a big gap from 28. Okay, so it really depends. Okay, sometimes, yes, it might be a, a big gap. It, it might influence the execution plan. But in most cases, since both numbers are quite low, okay, so for example, if we need to take a decision whether to use an index seek with key lookups or index scan, it doesn't really matter in this case. It means we have extra eight key lookups that we didn't account for. Okay, not such a big deal, but it really depends. Okay, it depends on the query what it, it does. Uh, but I'm interested to see, sorry, where does this number come from? Okay, how is the calculation uh, work? So let's look at the statistics again. Now we have another statistics auto created on member ID. Okay, it uses 7% in this case. So as you can see, it's dynamic. It depends on the number of rows and on some other factors. And what we can do, we can run the same query but with this trace flag, 2363 three on this uh, uh, specific query, it's a trace uh, query trace flag. We also need to use this one in order to output the information to the screen. And I run recompile to make sure that it compiles again, because what this trace flag does, it gives us information about statistics, which statistics we use during compilation and all the phases that the optimizer went through in order to estimate the number of rows. Okay, so this is really uh, interesting information. And it only outputs this information while a plan is compiled. So I want to make sure I, I'm adding option recompile. So we get the same results, the same plan, but now we have a lot of information here. I'm not going to go through all the information, uh, but the interesting thing here is this, okay? Loaded histogram for column member ID, which starts ID four, okay? 
So this tells me which statistics the optimizer chose to use because sometimes you might have multiple statistics for the same column. You have a column statistics and index statistics. Maybe you uh, uh, created uh, another one manually and so on. SQL Server needs to decide which one to use on which one to base its estimation. You can derive it from here. Okay, so again, if we go here, let's make sure that this is stats ID 4. Okay, so yes, the statistics on member ID is stats ID 4, and you can get information from using this trace flag. Now let's look at the statistics itself. Okay, we are looking for uh, value 1, 2, 3, 4. So the SQL, SQL Server can use the histogram, and it says, okay, value 1, 2, 3, 4 falls between these two values somewhere here, right? And in this range, the average number of rows is this. Looks familiar? So this is the exact value that we saw in the execution blend. It was rounded up to four uh, points after the four digits after the point. Okay, so it was 2992, but this comes from here. Okay, so quite easily we can estimate the number of rows for each and every value that you're going to give me. Uh, just need to look it up here and find the average number of rows. And again, as you can see, it was quite uh, uh, close to the real value. Uh, what happens when we do this? We you declare a local variable and then you use the local variable in the predicate. I don't know if you know or not, during uh, compile time, when SQL Server needs to generate the execution plan, a local variable is an unknown value. Okay, so SQL Server has no idea about the value of this local variable, doesn't know that it's this. And now it needs to come up with an execution for this query when this is unknown. Okay, so how many rows are there where member ID is unknown? I don't know. But SQL Server can still do something about it. And let me show you what it does. Okay, first of all, let's see the estimation. So the actual number of rows is, of course, we know it's 28, the same. But now the number of rows estimated is this, okay, which is pretty close because in this case uh, it's a uniform distribution. So we don't have uh, big uh, uh, gaps, but it's a different number. Where this number comes from? We don't know the value, but we still use an equality predicate, SQL Server can go to the old density. Okay, you can take this value. And if you take this value multiplied by the number of rows, you will get the exact same uh, value that we saw in the execution plan. Okay, because this is the average in the entire table. So I don't know where to look in the histogram because it's an unknown value, but I can still give an estimation based on the average in the table. And it's better than just saying, I don't know, and doing something else. I don't know what. Okay, so. Here, we took this value. Okay, it's a different value now. Let's copy it here. So if we take this multiplied by the number of rows in the table, okay, so this is the number that we saw in the execution plan. This is where it comes from. Okay, and by the way, here is a tip for you. Try to avoid uh, uh, using local variables like this, okay, because it's an unknown value. Sometimes it can really lead to, to poor performance. So either use parameters where you have parameter sniffing instead of local variables, or uh, if it's possible, uh, uh, if it makes sense, use constant here, not a local variable. Uh, or use option recompile if you can afford it. And then each and every time SQL Server will recompile the query at runtime. And then it can use the value of the local variable uh, to estimate the number of rows. But be careful when you use option recompile, because if this query runs many, many times per second, this can kill performance because it has to recompile all the time. OK, uh, just remember that. What happens if we do this? Not an equality predicate, but an inequality. Okay, how many rows are below one, two, three, four? Now this is more complicated because what do you do now? Okay, this is an unknown value. Oh, sorry, this is not an unknown value. This is first I'm doing an example where this is known. Okay, it's a constant value in this case. How SQL Server is going to estimate the number of rows for this? So the number here, this is the actual number. This is the estimated number. Again, pretty close, very good, accurate uh, estimate. If we look at the statistics, so what it does, again, it says one, two, three, four falls between these two values. Okay. How many rows are uh, uh, below one, two, three, four, and including one, two, three, four? So then first we have this row. Okay. So we have 22.8 rows uh, with the value one. Then we have all these rows between these two values. Then we need to add this number of rows, which is the exact value 552. And then it does a linear interpolation. It tries to, un to, to estimate how many rows are going to fall in the range between 552 and 1234 out of the entire range 552 and 5059. And it's going to take the number of rows and divide it based on this range. Okay. 
So I'm doing here a calculation. I'm not going to copy all the, the numbers uh, right now, but believe me, if I do the, the correct, if I get all the numbers right from here, you will get, you will see the exact same number that we saw in the execution plan. Okay, so this is how it does. It's, it's quite a simple calculation. And in most cases, again, if the statistics is updated, it's going to provide quite good estimates. Okay, um, and again, what happens now when this is an unknown value, and we're still going to use uh, an inequality predicate, Okay, so this is more complicated. In this case, I want to show you we have the same number of rows, but now the estimations are really off. It's 600,000 rows, okay, which has nothing to do with the actual values. And suspiciously enough, it, it's a very uh, round value. Okay, so in this case, the optimizer has no choice. It cannot use the histogram at all. Okay, what it does, it has a rule. It has several rules for those uh, estimations with unknown values. And one of the rules is when you use an inequality operator with an unknown value, it's going to use 30%, always. It's going to estimate that the uh, number of rows is going to be 30% of the total number of rows in the table. We have 2 million rows in the table. 30% is 600,000 rows in this case. And as you can see, this is really poor estimation. What happens with between? I have two values. I, I'm using between two unknown values. Then again, we have some rules. In this case, we have this number, which is around 16%. Okay. Now, this, this is something that changed between uh, versions. I'm going to show you later when we talk about the cardinality estimator, what happens with the old version of the cardinality estimator, the new version. Currently, I'm using SQL Server 2019 with the new version. Okay. So with the new version, it's around 60%. This is the estimation when you use between. And again, it's just it's just like a wild guess, okay? Because I really don't know which values you use there. Now let's try to update some rows and see what happens when SQL Server decides to update them automatically. So first, I'm going to update uh, 100 rows on the session events table, and I'm going to set uh, date and time to uh, to now. And I want to show you in the statistics if we look at the statistics on date and time, which is the first one. Now modification counter is 100 because we had already 100 rows updated or inserted or deleted, doesn't matter. Okay, uh, so it's 100. If we look at the last updated, it was updated again before we started the session, so it wasn't updated yet. And even if the modification counter is high enough and SQL Server decides it needs to update the statistics, it will only do it during the next execution of some query that needs statistics. It's not going to do it right away. OK, it, all, it always happens during an execution of some query. So let's run some query that uses date and time, such as this one. Let's see if something changes. We look at the statistics again. So no, nothing happens. Still 100 here, still the same time here. This means that 100 is not high enough to trigger an auto update statistics. OK, so let's update 50,000 additional rows. See what happens. OK, so we get this number still not updated because we haven't ran another query yet. Let's run the same queries before. And now, hopefully, it's going to update the statistics. So you can see it was updated right now and the modification counter is back to zero. OK, so we start from scratch again until the next time we need to update statistics. OK, so this is to demonstrate how it works. You can also, if you want to troubleshoot what's going on, you can use extend events or a SQL trace, there is a event for auto update statistics, so you can track when it happens exactly behind the scenes, but we can also see it from here. Um, we can manually update statistics, okay? So sometimes uh, the frequency of automatic update is not good enough, we can do it manually, okay? Um, either right now because we need to improve something or as a scheduled job, and then we can decide also again like I showed before what is going to be the sample rate, okay, if I want a full scan or not, and if I want to persist the sample percent or not. So I do it like this, and then you can see that now it's 100, and also the persisted 100, and it was updated again right now, okay. What else do we have? Um, oh, let's update again. Let's run the query again. Uh, 
I didn't show you before, but uh, before when I updated a fixed thousand rows, it, it was supposed to be updated. It was updated with the default sample rate of SQL Server, so it was like 10% or something. I forgot to show you that. Okay. And what I did now, in order to make sure it doesn't happen again, I used update statistics manually with persist sample rate. So now I want to show you that even though it was updated again, okay, it's back to zero. Now it persists the 100, okay, and we use a full scan even when SQL Server automatically updates. Okay. So this is important. Okay. Any questions so far? This was like an introduction to how statistics looks like how it's used by SQL Server. I have no questions in the chat. I have a question, but I think okay, you sure. will talk about, uh, will you talk about the asynchronous update stats later or not? Yeah, actually, um, uh, let's talk about it now. Okay, I don't have any specific okay. uh, demo. Do you have a specific question or just uh, in general what it means? Yeah, my, uh, my, my question is uh, without to, uh, when you run a query against a table and the uh, SQL Server realizes it needs the statistics for the first time, is the create statistics going to be done uh, asynchronous and uh, uh, SQL Server is just going to guess, or it, will the create statistics be synchronous? So, as you can see here, let's go back to the options. We only have auto update statistics asynchronously. We don't have that for auto create statistics. So statistics are always created synchronously, okay? Mm. Because if it's, it's not there at all, we really want to wait until it has statistics for even for the first query, because otherwise, again, the, the, the optimizer is blind. We're probably going to get really poor performance. So for creating statistics, it's always synchronously, but we can choose for update statistics when it needs to update whether we want to do it during the execution or if it's if we choose asynchronously this means the next time someone runs a query and now we need to have the statistics sql server will not wait it will continue with the query using the out of date the old statistics and then mm -hmm. it will trigger an asynchronous update statistics uh, which doesn't interfere with the execution now in many cases this is great this is okay i'm fine with using the previous version because the changes are not so important. It's not such a big deal, but sometimes I really want to, I prefer to wait uh, another a few milliseconds or I don't know how much until I have an updated version of statistics because I really need good performance for this specific query. Let's say it's a, a report that runs daily and the time it runs is really important. So I prefer to wait for a few more milliseconds rather than get a poor plan that will run for some minutes. Okay, mm -hmm. so it depends on the case. Okay. I hope this answers the, the question. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, let me close this. Continue with the Cardinati estimator. So again, the Cardinati estimator is uh, the component inside the optimizer, which is responsible for estimating the number of rows. All the times I showed you in the execution plan, the estimated number of rows, this is the component that is responsible to derive those values. Let's use again execution plan. Let's go back to the um, uh, example before when we, we use between two unknown values and as I showed you if you look at the execution plan we see that this is the value it estimates it is around 16 percent now I'm using again SQL Server 2019 it's important to know that in SQL Server 2014 Microsoft uh, almost rewrote completely the Cardinati estimator they created a new version of the Catinati estimator in 2014, which is very different in many, many aspects from the old version. So now we have two versions. We have the old one uh, prior to 2014, and we have the new one after 2014. They behave different. I will show you some examples for that. So if you are on a, on a 2012 box or earlier using the, the old uh, version, if you are on 2014, but also using the compatibility level of 2014 onward, then you are using the new version. In some cases, you can say, even though I will show you that here, even though I'm using 2019, for example, I want either uh, for the entire database or for a specific query, I want to use the old version of the Catenati estimator. And the reason is that it really behaves in different ways. It has different sets of rules. Um, hopefully, in most cases, the new version should perform better, but a lot of things can happen. So for some specific query, uh, for that specific query and the specific distribution of statistics in the relevant columns, you might get a better result using the old version. Okay, uh, the best way long term is to identify those cases and optimize the queries, rewrite the queries in some way that will get the best plan using the new 
version, okay? But as an intermediate uh, uh, option, you can say, okay, use the old ver version first so that we get good performance, then let's analyze and decide what to do for the long term, okay? So again, I'm using the new version, 16%. Let me show you one of the differences uh, between the versions is this. So now I can run this command, which means uh, use the legacy Cadenati estimation, the old version, okay? You can run this at the database uh, level. Or again, if you use uh, uh, compatibility level lower than 2014, it will have the same effect, but this will have other effects as well. This specifically affects the Cardinality estimator. And now the same query between with unknown values is going to produce this result, which is 9%. Okay, so just to show you as an example, one of the differences Microsoft decided to put in this uh, new version is going from 9% to 16%. Okay, I don't know why. Whatever. Um, let's move on. I'm still using currently the old version. I want to show you something else. There is a very common phenomenon called the ascending key problem. What the ascending key problem means, uh, and it's very common, let's say you have a large table. In my case, it's page views. Okay, I have a, a table that stores all the page views in my website. And the, the way we work with the table, we insert many, many rows, and we have an ascending key, which is the date and time. So every row that is inserted has a, an increasing value of the uh, date and time chronologically. And, and um, in this case, we have a problem because let's say that at some point, statistics on date and time is updated. So it's up to date right now. Great. We have a, a very accurate histogram. And let's say that the table is very large. It contains seven years of data. And people, usually users, usually uh, look at the last week. Okay. So the interesting part, the hotspot in the table is the last week. And uh, users have this predicate in all kinds of, of queries, for example. And if we do it now, we get good results because statistics is updated. But if we go one week into the future, statistics is not updated yet, okay, because the threshold was not met yet. And according to the histogram, one week from now, if we look at the histogram, in the last week, we don't have any rows. We have zero rows. So when users ask for this, the estimation is going to be zero, or actually it's going to be one. It never estimates zero. Okay, so it's going to say, I think there is only one row for this. While in the last week, maybe there are millions of rows, okay, and then we're going to get poor performance. Okay, so it's a very common uh, problem. It's called the ascending key problem, and I want to show you some options how to solve it. I'm going to simulate this problem by deleting data from the last week. Then I'm going to add the statistics with a full scan, so it's accurate as of now. And then I'm going to insert rows for the last week again. Okay, so this is how I simulate this problem. So now we are like one week into the future where statistics was updated one week ago. Okay, so I'm just simulating this problem. And let me show you if we look at the histogram. So as you can see here, we only have three steps in the histogram, and the last value, okay, is from last week, August 21, 21st. Okay, now if I run a query, with this predicate, give me the number of rows in the last week, and we look at the estimated number of rows, and compare it to the actual number of rows, then you can see here the problem. So this is the actual number of rows, almost 200,000, and this is the estimated number of rows. Like I said, one, okay, which is like zero. Okay, now this is a real problem in this case, because the optimizer estimates one, it uses a nested loops in a join here, because it thinks it's, it's going to do this sick only once. But in reality, it now has to perform this clustered index seek 200,000 times, which leads to a very large number of logical reads. Okay, so this is a very inefficient plan because of this uh, uh, wrong estimate. Now, one of the things that Microsoft uh, did in the new version of the Cardi estimator is to address this specific problem, the ascending key problem. Okay, and what they did, instead of just blindly looking at the histogram and saying, okay, there is not, nothing here. The optimizer uh, identifies this pattern, the ascending key pattern, and it says, OK, I get it. What, what's going on here? The statistics was updated as of last week, so I can estimate, I can try to guess based on the pattern how many rows are should be in the table in the last week, even if it's not represented in the histogram. OK, so they do this for us. So I'm going back to the new version. I'm running the same query. By the way, when you do this, you empty the plan cache for this database. So all the execution plans related to this database are going to be flushed out, okay? Which means every new query against the database now needs to be compiled again, which 
might be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on what happens there. But just be aware of that. So the same query now is going to get a new plan. And in the new plan, again, statistics have not been changed. Now we have an adaptive join. OK, because now SQL Server says, OK, I see what's going on here. We have uh, not just one row like before. OK, now look at the estimation. And again, pretty accurate, even though it's not even in histogram. OK, so this is just based on the new algorithm that identifies the authentic key problem, the, the pattern, and uh, estimates from there. And based on this number, SQL Server said, OK, I'm going to give an adaptive join in this case, which means at runtime in each and every execution, I'm going to decide based on the actual number of rows coming from here, whether to use a hash mesh join or a, nest, or a nested loops join, okay? Which is pretty smart, uh, much better than just using nested loops as we saw before, okay? So we get a much better plan. In this case, we can look here, by the way, what is the threshold, okay? So we have the adaptive threshold rows, which is this one, 16,000. So every time the number, actual number of rows is more than this, it's going to use a hash mesh join. Of course, in this case, we had around 190,000, so it uses a hash mesh join in this case, which leads to a much better performance and only this number of rows of the logical reads instead of the number we saw before. Okay, so it looks, it's a lot more efficient. Um, we can use this uh, trace flag 9481, which instructs the optimizer for this specific query, even though we're currently using the new version of the Gattinati estimator, please use the old one. OK, because let's say sometimes not in this case, OK, but sometimes it performs better. So we can do it on, on a query by query basis. And we will see that again, we get the same plan as before with this estimation of one row. OK, I, th so I think there's that. just one caveat with query trace on unless yes. they change that, that uh, query trace on requires you to have control server permissions. Uh, so if you have yeah, an yeah, application yeah. account right. that only has permissions on the database. But there is a use hint flag that was introduced in Service Pack 1 in 2016, which where you can hint to use the legacy right. quality estimator right. instead. And that's... I need to update my demo. You're correct, yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a use hint, which is a better way to do it. It's also in terms of permissions, but also in terms of readability. Okay, so you can see what mm. it means, not just a, a number. So thank you for that. I will update my demo. Um, yeah, sure. Okay, any other questions so far? Uh, no questions in the chat, very quiet audience. Okay, I hope this means that everything is well understood. They're stunned, <laughs> I think. Another question, yes, excuse please, me. Please. Yes. Yes, uh, is there any way of, um, in, in, regarding to avoid the, 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 the date and time update, uh, the update of the date and time, uh, using the cardinality estimator, is there any type of another type of rule to freeze the date and time, the date and time in the in the table, or or not before using the cardinality cardinality estimator? Uh, can you repeat the question? I'm not sure I understand uh, your question. Is there an action to to avoid uh, the the update of the date and time in a table? You is don't want type to update of freeze. When you, you want to when tell you're SQL using Server, the cardinality don't. estimation, you want to tell SQL Server not to update statistics. Yes, I I, I mean yes. if, if there is any freeze option for the date and time. Yeah, it's it's called nowhere compute. I don't remember the exact syntax, but you can specify for a specific statistics object and instruct SQL Server not to update it, not to recompute it. So yes, you can do that, but this is dangerous. Okay. Yeah, um, it it affects the cardinality estimation when you are using this option. No, no, it, it doesn't. By, by default, SQL Server, again, if you have this uh, uh, checkbox in the database level up to update statistics, then by default it will update all statistics unless you specify otherwise. Okay, thank you. Okay. But again, it's dangerous. Uh, so if you if you tell SQL Server not to update something automatically, you have to do it yourself some way. Okay, You need to have a job that runs a weekly or whatever and update some statistics. Otherwise, after some yeah. time, they will be used. I will have an error. Uh, I mean, I mean are useful for, for anything, okay? Yes. So, thank you for the question. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's go back to the old Cardinati estimator, and I want to talk about multi-column statistics now, okay? So this is another thing that was changed between versions. Oh, sorry about that. Um, so I want to look about in a, another table, inventory AdventureWorks products. I took uh, uh, the data from AdventureWorks database, 
And here we have some uh, inventory products, okay? So we have all kinds of products like uh, brakes and bikes uh, and so on. And for each product, we have the color, the price, the category, and we only have 295 rows in this table. Very small table, but it's great for my demo. What I want to do now, okay, first I wanted to look at the statistics, as always. So currently we have like nothing, only the primary key. Nothing happened yet, nothing interesting at least. Let's start with a query based on the product category. I want to look at the items which are in the category mountain bikes. Okay, so the result is 32 rows. We have 32 mountain bikes in this table. And again, of course, uh, uh, statistics was updated, was created on the fly. So if we look, as you can see, I can put the column name here, even though I don't know the exact name of the statistics, it will find it and give me the histogram. So for mountain bikes, as you can see, we have 32 equal rows. So SQL Server knows exactly how many rows are for this value. Okay, because it's quite easy. We have a small table with a small number of unique values. Um, so it's 32. If we look at the color, I want to look at how many items have the color silver. Then we get 36 rows. And again, if we look at the histogram for the color, silver, 20, 36. Okay, so SQL Server knows exactly how many rows are for each one of those. It gets an accurate estimate. That's fine. What happens now? How is SQL Server going to cope with this query? Okay, we have two predicates at the same time. We only have two single column statistics. We don't have a multi column statistics at this point for the two uh, column. Okay, so let's run this. The result is 16 rows. The estimation is this. 3.9. Okay, so again, both of them are small values, but in percentage, it's a, it's a huge, it's a big gap. Okay, let's see where does this number come from, and let's see what we can do about it. Okay, so first, let's look again at the statistics. So as you can see, we have two single column statistics which were auto created. So one thing we can see from here, SQL Server never automatically creates multiple column statistics, okay? It does not do that. It only creates single column statistics, okay? So we don't have now suddenly a new statistics which is multi-column. It doesn't happen. If we want it, we need to create it ourselves manually, okay? That's one thing we can see from here. And the calculation, okay? Remember, we had the number 3.9. The way SQL Server does it by using two single column statistics is this. First, it, it counts, it calculates the probability for the first one, which is 32 rows uh, divided by the number of rows in the table. And then for the second one, 36 rows, then it multiplies both probabilities. And then it multiplies this probability by the number of rows again to get the estimated number of rows. Okay, so it just uh, as assumes that there is, uh, uh, that these two columns are independent. Okay, and if we multiply the probabilities, this is going to be the estimate. So if I run this, you can see that we get, this is the exact value we saw in the execution plan compared to the actual values, okay? Which is not good enough. So again, let's go back to the new version. And one other uh, change that Microsoft made in the Cadenetti estimator is not to assume that they are independent, but you assume some level of dependency between different predicates, which in reality, in most cases, makes sense. But of course, not always. So now, the same 16 rows, but we get a different estimate of 11 rows, which is much better than 3.9. Okay, and let's see how this is done. So it, it's similar to before, but now when we multiply the probabilities, the optimizer takes, or actually the Cardinality estimator, takes the higher probability and calculates the square root and then multiplies. And if you have more than two, it will do the same square root of the square root of the probability and then uh, get to the number. So the Result of this calculation is the number we saw before. Okay, so this is again one difference, uh, another difference we have between them. Um, and this is an example, by the way, because uh, where the new version uh, might not produce better result than the old version. Okay, because maybe in some query it's really independent. Okay, and then the old version might produce better results. So it really depends. You need to understand what's going on there. Uh, we can also again, create manually multiple column statistics like this. Okay, this is something that SQL Server cannot do by itself. And now when we have multi column statistics. Let me show you first how it looks like. Okay, so here it is with two columns now. Okay, let me show you the 
histogram itself. Now, the problem is, again, if you use multiple local statistics, SQL Server still only calculates the histogram for the first one, in this case, product category. So it's really important which one is first, okay? And you need to play with it, and depending on the distribution, maybe it's better to put the color first. It really depends, okay? So now we have a histogram for the product category, but we also have, this is the only thing that we have now that we didn't have before, this number the old density value for the combination of both, okay? And the question is whether this single value can produce better results for SQL Server uh, compared to what it did before by multiplying the probabilities, okay? So let's see. We run this again with option recompile just to make sure that it uh, uh, generates a new plan. And now we get a different result, okay? So this probably means it's used the new multicolon statistics, but produces uh, um, less accurate result than before compared to 16. Okay. So again, it really depends. Sometimes by creating multicolon statistics, you can really improve the accuracy of the estimates and, and thus performance. Sometimes, like in this case, uh, it doesn't. You need to test it. Um, if we look again here and we take this value just to show you where it comes from, we put it here. Okay, so this is the number we saw in the execution plan. Okay, so we decided to use uh, the multicolon statistics, even though in this case it wasn't a good idea. So this is about multicolon statistics. I'm going to try to run faster to make it on time. <laughs> it's going to be challenging. I have two more uh, items here. Filter statistics first. I uh, want to say something. Any question? Uh, no, I just got a question about the uh, the scripts and uploads, and I answered in oh. the chat that uh, I will I will put a link on the SQL Friday site for it. Mm, sorry, I have a question. Yeah, Can I ask sure. it, please? Sure. Yes, is, is there any type of rule of using the the old or, or and the new version? Is there the a general one? rule? I mean, because oh, there are rule. some advantages and disadvantages about the new version and the old version. And is, is there any type of rule? Because um, I'm very new in this, in the statistics, in the SQL statistics, so there's any kind of rule for this? For so like I said this? before, there is no specific rule. Um, okay. The rule of thumb should be um, use the new version. Okay, you should prefer to use the new version uh, because it's better in, in all kinds of ways and you don't want to, to maintain uh, different versions for different queries. It's going to be hard to maintain those. So your goal, is for the long term to use only the new version for all of your workload. And then when there is a specific problem with some query, uh, you should try to optimize it and get the best plan using the new version. For some cases, as an intermediate uh, uh, option uh, for troubleshooting, you can say, okay, use the old version for now because I see it produces a better result for this specific query while I'm trying to optimize it and get a better result with the new version for the long term. Okay, okay. It's, thank it's you. kind of the way to go. Um, Okay, so I'm going to talk about filter statistics. Filter statistics is a really powerful tool. I think it's underestimated. Um, and let me show you some example. Again, if we go back to the ascending key problem, okay, just like before, this is, we're using now the new version, okay, so we get the same estimates as before uh, based on the uh, uh, algorithm. And what we can do, if it's not good enough, it's not accurate enough, we can create statistics manually with the filter, with the predicate. So I can tell SQL Server, create a statistics object, but only for rows in the last week, and do it with full scan. Now, two things are going to happen here. First, since it's only the last week, let's say out of seven years, it's going to be very, very fast to create a statistics, so it's not going to consume a lot of resources, so I can uh, uh, easily create it. And I can also use full scan, okay, again, because it's fast, so I'm going to get very accurate statistics with a full scan only on the last week, okay? But if I'm going to try to run this, because this expression here is not deterministic, I cannot do it. I have to use a deterministic, deterministic expression. So I'm going to use dynamic code to create it. I'm going to calculate uh, the date and time value for the last week here. I'm going to use it here, okay? And then I have a statistics object only for the last week. If I look, here, so for the first time, I can show you that there is a difference, okay, it's this one, between the number of rows and the unfiltered rows. This is the entire table, 5 million rows, and this is the number of rows used for my statistics uh, object on date and time. If we look at the 
uh, histogram. So you can see that we have a very accurate histogram with, in this case, where is it, 179 steps only for the last week. So this is really, really accurate. It's really easy for SQL Server when you want to look for values in the last week to get accurate results. So now if I run the query again, I get a different value. Okay, in this case, I think it's not even, yeah, it's 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 much better, so sorry. I confused it with another example. Okay, so you get this value compared to this value, so it's the exact same value, so it's really, really accurate, okay? So this is very powerful. Now, of course, this means you need to uh, create those statistics. You also need to manage it. You need, you need to, let's say, once a day, drop the, the previous one and recreate the statistics for the last week again or something like that. So you need to have a job that does it. It's not such a big deal, but you need to do some uh, development and management of this uh, solution. Uh, but it, pro it produces really, really great results. OK, so check it out uh, uh, and see where you can use filter statistics. And the last one is incremental statistics which is specific for partition tables. When you use partitioning, let's drop the filter statistics first. Let me simulate the ascending key problem again. Okay, delete rows from the last week. But now I'm going to add the statistics with incremental equals on. Okay, so this is started with 2014 and this is only relevant for partition tables. And when I do this, what it means it's a bit confusing. It's not going to create a statistics object per partition like it does with indexes, for example. It's still a single histogram for the entire table, but the calculation is going to be done per partition. So also the threshold when to add the statistics is going to be calculated per partition. And when a specific partition crosses the threshold, it's going to recalculate up the statistics only for that partition and merge the results with a single statistics object. So overall we get uh, much more updated statistics for a partition table. So if I show you the statistics with a histogram, as you can see, we have the same single histogram, okay? And it's currently updated as of last week. But now, if I'm going to insert rows in the last week, so I'm actually I have daily partitions in this table, okay? So for the, the last seven partitions, I'm actually crossing the threshold. So it's going to update statistics for those last uh, seven partitions. And, and in this case, during this insert, the statistics is already updated. And if I run this again, okay, so I get pretty close uh, estimates, okay, but they are based on the um, statistics which were already updated. Let me show you the histogram again. And as you can see now, it's a different histogram and it's ended uh, right now, today. Okay, so it's updated already. We can also run up the statistics manually for a specific partition if we want to. Okay, so let's say only the last partition is, is used heavily inserted and we want to up the statistics more frequently. We can do it for a specific partition. We don't have to wait for updating the entire table, but in this case we must use with resample because we can't mix different sampling rate. So when we update a specific partition, we must say use the same sample rate for the entire table. Okay, there's no other option. Okay, so I can do this. And also, we can run this just as the same as going to the options and uh, checking the, uh, turning it on. We can say when you auto create statistics for this database on partition tables, always create them as incremental, okay? Because by default it's off, okay? So we run, we can run this. So this can be really useful for a uh, partition table. This is the demo. Let me just go back and summarize. Any questions before I do a quick summary? No questions from the chat now. Okay, so we look at statistics. I hope that by now you will agree with me that this is really important because when we look at the execution plans, you can see that we have uh, sometimes very wrong estimates, okay? I think that the most important thing when you analyze execution plans is to look for the gaps between the esti estimated number of rows and the actual number of rows. In most cases, this is the reason this will lead to poor performance, okay? When you find such a gap, now you need to understand why. What led to this gap? There are all kinds of, of reasons. It could be parameter sniffing. It could be a local variable like I showed you because it's an unknown value. Uh, but in all cases, the cardinality estimate is trying to use statistics to come up with the best estimate. And in many cases, the problem is simply that the statistics are not updated 
okay? The last time it was updated was a long time ago, or it's not accurate enough because of the sampling rate, and the distribution is quite crazy in this table, okay? And in this case, you can you just need to add the statistics. Um, so it's really important to find those and, and uh, decide what to do. Use filter statistics, use multi-column statistics. I show you some examples here. And um, last thing I want to say, for most databases, for most workloads, I think, I don't know how many, but for most of them, the default behavior of SQL Server is really great. Just don't do nothing. Leave the auto-create and out the statistics on. It will do everything for you. This is fine. But for many cases, it's not good enough, either for entire workloads or even in a specific application for a specific table or even a specific column, it's not good enough because the distribution is crazy, the table is too large, you can't trust the default behavior. And then what I uh, uh, think you should do, you need to have some kind of solution. There are all kinds of solutions in the internet or you can develop one yourself uh, so that you have the statistics on an ongoing basis regularly. Let's say you run a job that runs uh, daily at night and updates all the column statistics uh, based on some thresholds or something like that. You can put your own logic in there and make sure that everything is updated all the time and not have to wait for the next update statistics, which will also use a sampling rate, which maybe is not the best thing uh, for you. Mm. So thank you very much for listening. I hope it was uh, useful. Uh, again, I will share the well presentation. It's not really interesting, but the scripts. <laughs> <laughs> and if you have any question later on, okay, feel free to contact me uh via email or twitter or whatever i will be happy to help thank you it was very much a lot of content but yes really uh, all of it really interesting and uh, really a good flow throughout uh, thank you. i'm my own take on it when i work with large data sets i usually always do asynchronous uh, statistics updates because yeah. if the query times out and the auto update stats times out, then you have a long queue of queries and they will all time out right. from the application. And I mean, but but it's if you're on reasonable data sets like 10, 20 millions of rows, then usually it doesn't matter because the sample rate is going to be quite slow, quite low. So. Low, yeah, right. But we we had an application stopping for uh, I mean if it's transaction intensive and uh, and you start to get a blocking chain then it's no fun. No, no, it's not fun at all. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I see no more questions. I see a lot of uh, thank yous and a great session. And I I agree, it was a great session. So, My pleasure. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm very gonna. Much. Incorporate probably a few ideas. I'm doing a presentation tomorrow about statistics. It started as a purely ascending key uh, thing, but I've added the legacy and new cardinality estimator and some more stuff. So uh, I might uh, add some more content to it after this. So great, great, great for inspiration. Uh, especially, I think the the in incremental is. Not that many, even people that use partitioning, they don't know about the incremental statistics. I agree, statistics. I agree. So, uh, For so me, it, I, I can tell you that in some cases, this is the main reason I'm going to use partitions, just for yeah. this specific feature. It's yeah. a really important one, yeah. Yeah, it, uh, it saves, uh, it could save you sometimes. So yeah. Definitely worth looking at. So I'm going to go to a meeting with, uh, you know, there is paid work to do as well. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to thank you for today. Uh, and thank I you. hope that we will be back to, you know, conferences where we actually can travel. And oh, uh, oh, yeah, really I hope so. to bump into you to some time and yeah, I'll uh, buy you a coffee or a beer or something. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank well, you. Thank guys. you very much. Bye. See you around. Bye.